Hello and welcome to the B9 Creator Software Overview, version 1.5.0. We've downloaded the software and installed it. In this example, we were using Windows 7. The software is also compatible with Windows XP and Windows 8. Additionally, you can download versions for Linux or Macintosh. We'll start the program by clicking on the icon. We see it's version 1.5.0. The new version has a, a great new feature that allows for automatic updating. When the program is started, assuming you're connected to the internet, it will automatically download any new changes uh, to the software or to the installation files. This will allow us to continually update the software without forcing you to reinstall with every major change or minor change. Uh, additionally, you can manually check for updates by going to Settings, Check for Updates. All files are up to date. Let's take a quick look at some of the other uh, menu items. Uh, we have File, which is your basic layout, Slice, Edit, which is no longer on the main screen, and Print. You see Layout, Slice, and Print on the main screen. Those are the functions that we will normally use during normal operations. Under Settings, uh, we can modify the Materials Catalog, which contains information on exposure timing for various resins. Uh, we can also modify the printer cycle settings which controls how fast or slow the printer does several of its uh, uh, cycle. Typically for these things you can leave them at their defaults. Uh, finally we have the new calibrate build table and calibrate projector options and we'll look at those in just a minute. Under help we have the old familiar B9 creator terminal utility. Uh, that still may be useful for uh, certain troubleshooting aspects but once again in normal operations that won't be needed and then we have the about box which will always show you your current version let's take a quick look now at the new calibration options to calibrate the build table you would select calibrate build table and this dialog appears it talks a little bit about why we want to calibrate the build table and then has a checklist which will step you through the process including automatically moving the table when needed uh, once that calibration is done, uh, you would uh, be, be assured that your build table is correctly calibrated. Uh, the second calibration that is sometimes required is the projector. How we calibrate the projector determines the resolution in the XY dimension. If we move the projector up close to the build area, the image will get small and the pixels will be high resolution. For example, we have high, medium, and low at high, 50 micron pixels are great, but the build area volume is reduced to 2 inches by 1.5 inches by 8 inches. If we pull the projector all the way back to low, our pixels increase to 100 micron square, but the build area also increases to 4 inches by 3 inches by 8 inches. You will, of course, need to determine which resolution works best for you when you're calibrating your projector. Uh, there's some, uh, once again, a checklist which will step you through the process uh, for calibration and uh, should make that process much easier than it has been in the past. So now let's go look at the familiar layout that you may already be used to. Um, we click on that button and it brings out the layout screen. Uh, a couple new things here. We can now turn perspective on and off. We can select a top view, a front view, or a right view. Um, so that's handy for manipulating your uh, models. Now let's import an STL model. We click on the Add button. Uh, we see we have some STL models in this directory. Let's open the birdcage. So I click on that and click Open. We import the birdcage and there it is just as you might expect. Now I can rotate the viewpoint around by right clicking the mouse but button and holding it and, I, and dragging. So that that's really smooth. Um, let's go ahead and look at it from a front view and we'll go ahead and turn off the perspective and we'll zoom in here a little. Um, let's move that around in the vertical so we can go ahead and kind of move it around but we'll lift it up off the ground a bit. Turn our perspective back on and there you can see the bird table is just floating there as you would expect. Uh, some of the new features we if we move the object to where it is no longer on the build table that's indicated by the wall or walls turning red which is pretty handy. 
you're probably used to that. Obviously, the other things we can do is spin, which allows us to basically rotate about the z-axis. We can orientate, which allows us to kind of tilt it in, in the uh, x and the y-axis. And we can reset all that if we don't like it. We can also snap it to the floor, or like I demonstrated, we can move it in the vertical. There I moved it below the floor, so the floor turned red. So we'll go ahead and move it back um, into the build area. And let's take a look at the new support feature. I'll click on the supports tab and uh, we'll select medium supports for this uh, and we've got add selected so I'll just start kind of clicking where I want some supports. Now you notice when we look at it from the bottom the floor disappears and the supports become invisible so we can actually see where we want to add supports which is a great feature. <clears throat> Uh, not only can you add supports which go to the floor, but you can also add supports which just go from the object down to the model. Let's modify some of these supports. So um, I've clicked the modify button up here and we can just start deciding where we want that support to go to. And you can see there's all sorts of options. If you try to put a support too high where it would build up instead of down, it turns red and we don't allow that. Um, we can also grab the bottom and drag it around. So if you wanted a nice angled support, that's possible as well. And you notice as I drug it off the bottom, it changed. It changed from a cone for growing down to a, a platform for attaching to the base. Uh, we can do that, um, you know, tilt them like that. If we want to uh, make it straight again, we can click on it and hit the Make Vertical. Um, so you get a lot of different options for, for adding supports manually. We'll go back to the model. Uh, once you've added supports, you can still do things like you can spin and the supports stay with the model. You can scale and the uh, supports also stay with the model as you might expect. You can actually move the model and the supports stay with it. And including if you raise the model, pretty much as you might expect it to work. Now, let's say you've supported an object, but you want to print two of them. You can click Duplicate, and it not only duplicates the object, but also the supports. And we can now even do things such as scale the duplicate to make it bigger or smaller. We can spin the duplicate to, you know, change its orientation. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if our models overlap, they'll still slice and print. For example, that would still slice and print, although I don't know why you'd want to do it. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty good overview, I think, of the new layout and support uh, tools that we have available. Let's go ahead and add one more model just for fun. Uh, we'll put in a Metrotron. And now you see that's a fairly large model for this um, size build area, it's overhanging things. It would still slice and print, but obviously the parts outside of the red area would not get printed. Um, we'll scale that down a little and move it off to the side. Let's go ahead and quickly add some supports for it. Now the model that you're supporting, when you're supporting it, everything else goes away. I'm going to use a medium support again. We'll put uh, support here and then kind of see where we're putting them. Uh, probably going to need one there and maybe there and maybe just a few stabilizing structural type supports there. So that would probably print fine like that. Um, I don't really like where that one is so I'm going to modify it a bit. Put it, put it uh, maybe there instead. And I'm going to spread out Let's see, first let's go back and lower the model because it's, it's sticking up there pretty tall. And we'll go back to the supports. And I'm going to modify the ones that are put in there so that the, uh, they actually build in here at, at various different angles. It's always good to angle your supports a little because then the 
the circular pattern isn't repeated over and over on the PDMS and it lasts longer. All right, so we probably spent way more time demoing this, but we're pretty proud of this new feature. Um, once you've uh, once you've laid out your layout, you can save that, so you can come back to it any time. We'll call this one um, test layout and hit save. Uh, and now that we're done with the layout, we can go ahead and close down the layout and let's look at slicing real quick. I'm going to open up the layout file we just created. We can give it a job name like um, Bird Cages in Metrotron. <clears throat> uh, the big thing about the slice dialog is we get to select how thick or thin we are slicing. Uh, since our pixel size is 100 microns, I'm probably going to go ahead and slice at around 76 here. Uh, it, that also depends on your resin. If you're using a high resolution resin, you can slice thinner. Uh, once you have those parameters set, go ahead and hit the slice button. Choose a name for the job file. Uh, it defaulted to test layout, and that's fine. We'll save the job file, and we'll let it slice. <clears throat> Our slicer allows for multiple STLs to overlap, and it still slices correctly. Uh, that slows us down because that's a lot more math. But with this new release, our slicer is slicing about ten times, I'm sorry, about six times faster than it was previously. So I think you'll like that. And we'll just give this a little bit of a time a little bit of time to go ahead and complete slicing. And slicing is completed. All sliced all layers sliced in the job file has been saved. So we hit OK and we'll close down the slicing dialog. The only thing left to do now is print. So let's take a look at the uh, print hosting software. We'll click the print button. We'll select the job file that we just created as the one we wish to print. Say open. Uh, we get a warning here that says the XY pixel size of the selected job, 100 microns, does not agree with the printer's calibrated size. So <clears throat> this is just telling us that we, we uh, created a job for 100 micron resolution, but we were our projector is currently calibrated to 75. So we could go ahead and print, but we would get a bad aspect ratio from our print. But we'll go ahead and continue for demonstration purposes. So you see the, the name that, of the job file and the description. It's 100 microns XY. We slice it at 76.2. Uh, we need to select the material that we're going to print with. So right now we've got um, three possibilities that, that uh, that we've preloaded, and you can add, you can make your own material um, specifications as well by modifying the materials catalog. But uh, let's go ahead and say we're going to print with red. Uh, red is a little bit lower resolution for the Z, and it's best for slicing between 50 and 80 microns. The cherry is higher resolution for thinner slices. So we select the red, um, and it's populated some various data here. The uh, first attached layers are going to there's going to be two of them and they're going to cure for 60 seconds and that ensures that we get a good cure initially to that build table so that we get it so the object sticks to it well. Um, following that uh, we have some different parameters for curing. Um, we can mirror the print if you wish to print something like you printed the right shoe you want to print it again as a left shoe you would just click mirrored print and, and that would work for that. We get some estimates. Uh, we're going to use about 6.8 milliliters of resin. There are 728 layers to print. Uh, the estimated time for that print is about 10 hours and 29 minutes and that is uh, has been updated. Uh, a bug has been fixed in this in this release so that time should be fairly accurate. It should be conservative now. Uh, <clears throat> this is a fairly tall print. Uh, we're looking at 72 millimeters tall. Uh, so once again we have the familiar checklist we no longer have a dry run option. Really, if you wanted to do a dry run, you would just select dry run material, which has very, very uh, fast times, and then you wouldn't put your vat or your build table in your machine. You would just let it run uh, without actually printing anything. But you'd want to inspect your printer. You want to make sure the vat and the build table table are in place. Uh, you want to re you want to reset or home your your printer and move to the fill level. Step four, you would add 
your, your uh, resin to the bat. Step five, you would install the sweeper, close the hatch, and then hit print. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. My, my printer is set up sort of for a dry run. Um, we can simulate we added the material to the vat and that we've installed the sweeper and closed the hatch. So uh, once all these steps are complete, we can now hit the print button and it brings up the print status dialog. Uh, we see that we're connected. Uh, we're using monitor 2 for the projector. Currently the projector is turning on. We're going to print the test layout, uh, which was bird cages and Metrotron. Total layers to print, 728, and currently we're powering up the projector. Uh, it's about 2 hours and 23 minutes remaining, or it'll be done about 7.16 this evening, p.m. Now we see that the projector is turned on and is now warming up. The status has changed uh, to warming up. And once it's completely warmed up, it'll begin printing. Usually takes about a minute or so for the bulb and everything to get print or get fully warmed up. Now the status is on. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's actually uh, begun the print process. We're creating layer one. Uh, now we released it. We're repositioning to layer two, and so forth. While it's printing, we can pause, and it will complete the cycle that it's uh, uh, the layer that it's currently printing, and then it'll go into a paused mode. Uh, when it's paused, you can manually position the build table and the vat with the toggle switches. This is useful if you want to raise uh, raise the build table after maybe you've printed 10 or 20 layers and you want to make sure that it's actually printing correctly. Uh, you can go ahead and raise that, check it out, make sure it's working right. If it's not, you can hit abort. If everything looks good, you can hit resume and the print will uh, resume from right where it left off. It'll automatically move the build table back down and everything uh, to the correct position. Uh, the only caveat there is if you pause and do that, you will probably see a line in your print at that layer where that pause took place. So if you're going to pause and check things, we recommend you do it early while, while it's only affecting the supports and not the object itself. Uh, so we'll go ahead and abort this because we're not really printing and say OK. So that completes our overview of the B9 Creator version 1.5.0 software. Uh, you can download it. It's always free at b9creator.com and we expect to be producing uh, several more of these instructional videos and tutorials in the uh, weeks to follow. Thank you.